Hello and welcome to the business behind small business. Whether you're selling or staying, we're here to remind you that just because you own a business doesn't mean you are a business owner. We are your hosts, Savannah Stone and Tiffany Kao. There's a lot of business behind small business, so let's get to it. Welcome to season three. Can you believe we've made it to season three and still have so much to talk about? <laughs> Feels like just yesterday that we started. Yeah, it really does. Um, well, so we're very excited for the new year and for all of the new segments and program changes. So just like your business, we're always striving to improve and be a better and more educational podcast for you. We are here for you. We're here to help you learn and become better business owners. And as the season goes along, we'll continue to work towards making our show better for you. And saying that, today's show is about money. I guess every show leads to money, but today's show is about how much money you should be paying yourself, the business owner, and what the difference is between an asset and a liability. As your business grows, what you get paid and how you get paid could be the determining factor behind how much tax you pay and how the IRS defines your business. Before we begin, please note our disclaimer. This is available in both our show notes and on our website and should be referred to before and or after this podcast. Take it away. Right, pay is, thank you. Well, pay is such a tricky, tricky subject, is it not? It is. <laughs> Especially for new business owners, because uh, Savannah, I'm sure you've seen this before too, where there are some business owners who take a little too much pay out of their business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little too, too much. much. And then yeah. others who don't take enough. Yeah. Right? They work so hard in their business and they're not paying themselves enough. And this is also important because what happens is they look at their bottom line. They're like, oh my God, I'm doing so well. And then it turns out that they didn't pay themselves anything. So they're just working for yeah. free. Yep. Pretty much. We're not here to work for free people. No, <laughs> no one is. <laughs> so, no. So let's, um, let's see if we can go down this, uh, this topic without it getting too complicated because there's a little bit of tax. That's a little bit of operational business accounting. There's a little bit of emotions. I'm sure there's a whole lot of stuff that we can go through. A lot of so <laughs> I'll let it emotions. Mm. <laughs> Okay, so the way I think about this and the way I usually tell my, my clients or just other business owners is a, there, you have certain options depending what type of business you are, how many people are in the business. So if you're by yourself, so you own the whole shebang, <laughs> you have certain options that is only for you when you're by yourself. So this is only limited to yourself, meaning that as a company, you can own, you, only a person who is 100% of the company can be a sole proprietor or a single member LLC. I mean, hence, it's called single member LLC for a reason. Yes. <laughs> can't have more members than member a single member LLC. Yeah. <laughs> Make a note about that, right? right. So if, yeah. if, you are, if you own your company 100%, then those two types of tax entities only available for you if you're by yourself. Now, you do have other options, but just remember, we're just saying what's limited to just an option of you being by yourself. So as a single, like as a single member LLC and a sole proprietorship, you have ways to take money out of your business that is much more flexible than any of the other tax entity types. So when we say the other ones, we're talking about S corps, C corps, partnership, multi-member LLC, all the stuff that we're gonna define in a few minutes. But as a single member LLC and a sole proprietorship, there's a lot of flexibility. Like honestly, like the IRS, doesn't really care how you take money out of the business. They see you and the business as one of the same. So you can literally write a check to yourself whenever you want and just withdraw the money out of the bank. Although that's also probably also where people get in trouble, right? Because some people get yeah, a little That's exactly why they get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that flexibility, typically those kind of pays we like to label as draws. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's essentially what it sounds like. It's a draw out of your business bank account, right? And you get to do it whenever you would like. Now there's some pros and cons to this, uh, which let's kind of table that for a minute, just because I don't want to muddy the waters way, way too much. And let's go through the rest of the options. So 
if you're owning your business a hundred percent, or if you have more than one person or like a partnership in the business, then you have other options that's available to you. You have an S corp, you have a C corp, or you can also declare yourself as a multi-member LLC. That's also known as a partnership. So essentially you and some other people decide to get together and own a business and you don't own hundred percent. Maybe you own 95%, maybe you own 60%, but somebody else owns something else. So it's not just you anymore. So at that level, you have a couple of other options to take money out of your business. Now it does get a little more complicated, right? Because you're not by yourself anymore. So you can't just free willy whatever you want to do. <laughs> I don't think your partners will be really happy with the fact that you're just, you know, taking money out as you would like. So there's a bit of more structure to it. And the IRS also gives you guidelines to make you put structure to it, right? So you can, as an S Corp, you are actually required to take money out of the business through a salary, meaning, yes, you get a W-2 at the end of the year. Yes, you probably have, you, you have to run yourself through payroll and pay payroll taxes. And just so that it's clear, you actually have to do that. Like, you can't just, you know, say, eh, I don't feel like it, anything like that. <laughs> Like if you are like a big boy and big girl enough to go declare yourself as an S corp, the IRS expects that you have enough money to go pay yourself a reasonable salary as part of, you know, running your business. So yeah. just make sure that you understand that because uh, Savannah, I know you've seen this before where we oh, yeah. had business owners who are single member LLCs and go off and draw a salary. And we're like, that is completely not allowed at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Right. Single member LLC, you can only do draws unless right. you, or an LLC, and then you elect it to be an S Corp, mm -hmm. then you can take a salary out. Yes. Now, we've also seen companies who are an S Corp and take no money out, which is, again, where you get in trouble because, to be clear, IRS demands that you take a reasonable salary. So. Yes. It says it in the application. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm I mean, sure everybody reads, right? Like, right, 100%. It's in the application, like, it says there that you're going to have to take out a salary, remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you're right. And for the purpose of this discussion and every future discussion that we talk about this, salary means W-2. So think yes. payroll, think payroll taxes, think W-2 income. That's what salary means. Mm -hmm. so, now, for companies that are C-Corps, yes, you also take salaries out, but you also have an option to take out distributions. Actually, let me take that back. As an S-Corp, you can also take out distributions as well with their salary. Yeah. Now, yes. now, they're called two different things because distributions – Yes, you can write a check to yourself, but it's taxed and seen differently, and it's also recorded differently. Mm -hmm. So you have two options. You can either do a salary or you can do a distribution. Okay. Now, let's say that uh, you have partners and you've decided to form a multi-member LLC or a partnership instead, right? So this is where it gets a little tricky because... You know, you have partners now, like I said, you can't just take money out the, no matter which way you want. It gets down into the nitty gritty of how much can you take out and how much is fair <laughs> because, hey, it's a partnership. So all of it, a lot of it comes down to your operating agreement and, depending, and deciding how much you can take out. Now, when you are a multi-member LLC or a partnership, on top of um, on top of salaries and um, distributions, you do get another option, which is called guaranteed payments. Now, it's called guaranteed payment because it's supposed to be guaranteed in a way, <laughs> meaning <laughs> that you and your partner sit down and you decide how much money you're going to pay out of the company for, you know, for each partner. You, you can decide why you're paying each partner because, you know, that gets a little... That gets a little hairy as to, you know, how much each partner is contributing and, you know, are they doing it in money? Are they doing it in capital? Are they doing sweat equity? Whatever the case may be, right? But basically you sit down and you decide and you're like, hey, irregardless of how much money the company makes, we, the three of us have decided that, or four of us or five of us or two of us have decided that this is the amount of money we'll be able to take out every single month on a set basis. And that's irregardless of whether or not the company is making money. So, as you would imagine, if you're kind of a young company just coming up, that could get a little tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't make money for a few months and you have this guaranteed salary in place, you still have to pay out all the partners, regardless right. of whether or not the company can float all that in cash. Mm -hmm. A little tricky, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it is a popular option just because 
Well, I mean, I guess it, ke- it keeps things kind of fair, right, Savannah? I don't see it happen way too often that people mm-hmm. use guaranteed salary, but it is a where t- it is a, a a method to make everything fair for all of the partners, making sure mm-hmm. that all the partners are taking out kind of what they're owed. Yep. And all this goes back to your operating agreement, mm-hmm. which I hope you have if you have partners. <laughs> That's a whole other episode. <laughs> That's true. We can have a whole other episode to just talk about, you know, having things on paper (laughs) and whatnot. Now, the reason why paying yourself and how you pay yourself is so important is because the impacts of it on taxes at the end of the day, right? There's pros and cons to all of this. As like a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, yes, you have a lot of flexibility because like I said, you can write yourself a check and just take a draw out of your bank account. But The con of that is you're subject to self-employment tax and self-employment tax kind of sucks because not only are you paying for the uh, Medicare and the social security tax for like for um, well, you're paying like the full percentage of Medicare and social security tax. So you're paying like a um, overall, almost approximately like a 15% tax on everything that you are you know, making on your business. And that's a high tax. And that's a tax that you don't necessarily pay the same way if you're going through a salary. Because mm-hmm. if you have employees, as you know, as an employer, you you pay half of the Social Security and Medicare tax. Your right. employee pays half, you pay half. So that's get, that 15% gets split down the middle in a sense, mm-hmm. right? Now, as, as a, um, as a uh, sole proprietor, L- single member LLC, when you pay yourself that, you're paying for both taxes, which is why it kind of stinks a little bit. Mm-hmm. But if you're taking out a salary, you only pay, you still do pay both sides as the owner taking out a salary of your business. But the, the plus side of that is you can kind of write off the employer tax taxes as part of an expense to your company, right? Mm -hmm. You can't do that in a single member LLC. You can't do that in a sole proprietorship. You just kind of have to eat that and pay Uncle Sam. But Mm -hmm. at least as a uh, C-Corp, S-Corp, multi-member LLC or a partnership, you can actually take the employer taxes as a, you know, as a deduction, as an expense on your company that actually lowers your taxable income on your company. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the effects of that typically means a little bit less tax liability on the back end, but it's not as flexible. Right. right. You can't do it whenever you want. You got to do it on a schedule. Most likely you have to, you know, bring on a payroll company to help you kind of, you know, make sure you're paying out your salary, taking all the taxes out properly and all that fun stuff. So it just becomes a little bit more expensive. And, um, you know, that's the kind of the downside of it. So. Well, I kind of feel like if you're going to be doing any form of payroll, you probably should have a payroll company do it for you um, just to be on the safe that's side, true. just to make sure that you're not missing anything. Right. Like, yeah, I, I think I think some payroll companies are underrated. Again, I, I any payroll companies out there listening to us, if you want to sponsor us for giving you a prop right now, please do. But <laughs> uh, yes. So but no, no, we even as practitioners in this space, right? Like we're like, no, go get a payroll company. Don't yeah. try to do this yourself. It's not no worth no it idea. to try to do it yourself when you consider, especially if you're going to be the only one on payroll. I mean, if you're only paying for one person on payroll or two or three even four people on payroll, it's way worth it to have a company do it as opposed to you doing it. I completely agree with that. And I think what what doesn't get advertised enough, maybe, and I don't know if any of it wants us to advertise this, but for most of the time, these payroll companies, whether it's like an ADP paychecks or even the regional companies that can also do a really great job with payroll, they they have like an assurance on the fact that they'll, you know, keep up with all the laws. They'll keep up with, you know, what, what the yeah. changes are and they'll, they'll effectively implement that into your account so that you have a little bit less to worry about. And they file all your taxes for you, make yeah. all your tax deposits for you for the state and federal, which by the way, that stuff is confusing as anything. There's different mm-hmm. timing, different schedules, different amounts, different forms you have to fill out. And they, kind of put a bit of a guarantee on that, that look, if we run your payroll and assuming that you give them the right information, they kind of guarantee they have like a liability, like a customer service to guarantee that they'll file everything right for you. So that Mm -hmm. look, if something goes wrong and an oops happens, which, Hey, you know what? It'll happen because Mm -hmm. it gets kind of confusing. They'll typically have great customer service and they'll help you take care of all of it. Make sure the refund gets back to you and just, you know, really take care of you. And I, I feel like that's really what you're paying for. 
And laws are changing, regional laws change, county laws oh. change, state laws change, federal laws change. I mean, just recently, just as of January 1st, a bunch of stuff changed. So <clears throat> as opposed to you trying to keep up with something that's not even in your wheelhouse, yeah, it's so much better to just worth the money. a payroll company. Yeah, absolutely worth the money. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Now, I know, Savannah, you got some, you got some amazing examples for us. That I do. A little number and put a little number to these words. <laughs> yes. So, so paying yourself, as we have mentioned, is not as easy as it may sound. There are so many factors to consider, and truly, the decision on how to get paid is really twofold. So, part of it is based on owner's draw and part on owner's equity. So, I'd like to start by first defining what a salary is and what a draw is. An owner's draw is when the owner takes funds out of the business for personal use. This can happen at regular intervals or it can happen when you need it. A salary, however, is when the business owner pays a paycheck uh, of a set amount on a set day during a, a set period. Now, um, before I go any further, just know that I'm probably going to um, parrot some of the things that Tiffany said, <laughs> but you know, some of what I have to say is important too. And uh, it's, it's, yes, it is. <laughs> it's a little different. So um, forgive me, but I, I might, you might hear some of the same information, but to be honest, it's so complicated that to hear it more than once might help you better understand it, especially when it's being described in two different ways. Yeah. If we have so, to repeat it seven times, we will. Yes, absolutely. So you might not know yet whether you should pay yourself through a draw or pay yourself through a salary or a combination of the two. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into how business classification plays a part in your decision making. So there are five main types of business entities. These are C Corp, C Corporation, S Corp, S Corporation, a sole proprietorship, LLC, which is a limited liability company and partnership. How your business is structured will determine how you should be getting paid. Each of these structures have different roles for compensation. So now we'll dive into what owner equity means. This is a term you've probably heard so many times um, from your accountant, from your CPA, and even from us. Uh, <laughs> defining <laughs> equity the definition of equity as the remaining value invested into a business after all liabilities have been deducted. So this could be equipment assets to business cash you've contributed at the launch of your business or what some people even call sweat equity, which is the work that you did that you didn't necessarily pay yourself for, but um, some something tangible came out of it. Uh, knowing what your equity is and understanding it will help you better determine how much you can draw. This is important because your total draw cannot exceed the total owner equity. Are so, you are you talking about basis and stuff? <laughs> business owner's favorite word. I think that's the number one question I heard my entire career. What is basis? <laughs> Yes, yes. Right. So I, I'm doing what I can to help you all understand better what it, I mean, you don't want to tick off your CPA or your accountant by, by, by making oopsies. So this is how <laughs> I try to help you, help you better understand like what it is to, you know, pay yourself and what the implications of that is. Yes. So before you make a decision, you also have to take into consideration what the, what those top tax implications could be. So, for example, if your company has a C-Corp, you are subject to double taxation. A C-Corp files a tax return and pays taxes on the net income or the profit. Generally, all the other business uh, entities, or rather business structures, are pass-through entities. So what that means is that they're passing the company profits and they pass the company losses directly to the owner. So it just goes straight through. Um, so now you're probably wondering how much should I be paying myself, which is, you know, the whole reason why we're talking here. Or maybe you're wondering, have I been overpaying or underpaying myself, which is, you know, ex again, why you're listening to our show today. Take the following factors into account. Your business structure, as I mentioned, your business performance, uh, the growth of your business, your personal needs, meaning what your personal budget is, because, you know, you do have to live, you got mortgage, you got car note, you know, whatever it is, you got to make sure that what you're making out of your business is enough to help you survive. Um, 
And then what you think is a reasonable compensation for someone in your position. So, you know, if you are just the, I don't know, the admin of your company, maybe don't be making 150000 a year. Just, just saying. Um, once, you, <laughs> once you consider all of the factors, you can hopefully determine whether to pay yourself with a salary, a draw, or a combination of both. Okay, so now let's look at the pros and cons of draws and salary. Um, I'm going to start with the draws. With an owner's draw, you have more flexibility to pay yourself, differing amounts based on how well or not so well your business is performing. However, an owner's draw is going to reduce your business's equity, which then reduces the funds you may have available for business spending. Uh, does your company have overhead? Does it have a lot of overhead? Does it have inventory? Uh, if, if spending or overhead is very important to your business, a draw might not be a good idea. So on the other hand, the pro of a salary means that there's less administrative work and the taxes are going to be deducted from your paycheck automatically, whereas with an owner draw, you pay the taxes after the fact. This makes it so much easier for you to track your income and your expenses. However, it's a set amount all the time, which means, as Tiffany mentioned, if your business isn't doing so great, it could create cash flow problems. Figuring out how much to pay yourself can sometimes cause more headache than it should, um, especially if you have a seasonal uh, a seasonal job or if you maybe you don't even have a seasonal job uh, I mean I would say that I kind of have a seasonal company because right now is like a super busy time for us mm -hmm. um, but but then again I kind of feel like I've been on uh, 100 miles an hour since 2020 <laughs> so, is it seasonal I don't know but does these are 24 7 to me <laughs> it's been I mean I haven't stopped since 2019 anyway so what does pay look like with within different business structures. So let's say you're a sole proprietor and you pay yourself through an owner's draw. I'm gonna use an example from a QuickBooks article and I'll link it in our show notes as well. I don't think I could have said it better, so this is why I'm choosing to paraphrase it. Patty is a sole proprietor who owns Riverside Catering. She contributed $50,000 when the business was formed at the beginning of the year. Riverside Catering posts a journal entry to record her capital contribution by entering $50,000 to the cash account in the debt column and 50,000 to the owner's equity account in the credit column. A normal balance for an equity account is a credit balance. So Patty's owner equity account has a beginning balance of 50,000. During the year, Riverside Catering generates 30,000 in profits. Since Patty is the only owner, her owner's equity account increases by 30,000 to 80,000. The $30,000 profit is also posted on, on as income on Patty's personal income tax return. I don't know about you, but I kind of feel, I'm getting the sense of those. If one train is going at 100 miles an hour and the other train is going at 200 miles an hour, at what point do they crash? Um, I feel like, uh, yeah, I'm having flashbacks too. Like seriously, oh. these word problems kill me. Yeah. But but I'm hoping that it kind of makes a little bit of sense. Um, she, Patty can choose to take an owner's draw at any time. She could choose to take some or even all of her $80,000 owner equity out of the business and the draw amount would reduce her equity balance. So if she chooses to draw 40,000, the owner equity now is 40,000. So keep in mind that Patty pays taxes on the $30,000 profit, regardless of how much of a draw she takes out of her business. Do I still have everybody? Give it a minute. Give it a minute. Let's think. <laughs> okay, so now let me. So uh -huh. really quick to that point, though, one thing I wonder if like our listeners are thinking about is, you know, why is this, why is equity so important? Like, why is that? And I don't know if, like, first of all, equity is the worth of your business, right? right. So like, it literally is like, if you look at it, that is the worth of your business. So as you would imagine is if you're taking out more than what your company is making, Mm -hmm. It's what happens to the worth of your business. Right, exactly. Right? And this has implications, which I think we can get into a little bit later, but just okay. kind of keep that in mind that it's important to keep your equity in the positive. For uh, sure. For any business, but especially as a sole proprietor, single member LLC, because you have all this flexibility of writing stuff like checks out of the bank account for yourself, it is super easy to fall into a negative equity for your business, meaning I mean, your business is negative. Like it's, I mean, it's past zero. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a good thing. So it uh, is. just kind of keep that in mind why Savannah's example is so important. <laughs> right. So <clears throat> now let's say you have a partnership and you take an owner's draw. Equity balance is generally increased by capital contributions and, and the business's profits. 
it's then reduced by partner draws and losses. Um, so money going in, money coming out. Um, I'm again going to paraphrase. Uh, Patty, we're back to Patty. Uh, Patty not only owns her catering business, but she's also a partner in Alpine Wines, a wine and liquor distributor. Yeah, I mean, go Patty. Patty's one of many talents. She is. Patty and Susie each own 50% of Alpine Wines, and their partnership agreement dictates that partnership profits are shared equally. Patty contributes 70000 to the partnership when the business is formed, and Alpine Wine posts a journal entry to record her capital contribution by entering $70,000 to the cash account in the debt column and $70,000 to the owner's equity account in the credit column. The partnership generates $60,000 in profit in year one, and $30,000 of the profit is reported to Patty on a Schedule K-1. Patty includes the K-1 on her personal tax return and pays income taxes on the $30,000 share of partnership profits. Mm -hmm. Assume that Patty decides to take a draw of $15,000 at the end of the year. Here is her partner equity balance after these transactions. 70,000 in contributions plus 30,000 share of profits minus 15,000 owner's draw. 85,000, <clears> excuse me, as the partner equity balance. Keep in mind that a partner cannot be paid salary, uh, but a partner may be paid a guaranteed payment for services rendered to the partnership. Like a salary, a guaranteed payment is reported to the partner and the partner pays income tax on the payment. The partner to clarify profit. though, really quickly, mm -hmm. you just said a good point, right? Is guaranteed payment of salaries. Is, yes. It's like a salary, but you don't run it through payroll or anything like that. Like guaranteed payment is you can, again, write a check out if you need to. It's more of just the timing and you sticking to your own schedule. You can yep. run it through payroll because some people do it just because it's easier for the direct mm -hmm. deposit and stuff like that. But like you don't take any taxes. You don't take any payroll taxes or anything out. It's just basically mm -hmm. like a transfer of money from yeah. business bank account to your partnership account. So Right. Yeah. Right. And the partnership's profit is lowered by the dollar amount of yes. any guaranteed payments. Expense, yes. Okay, so you're an LLC. <laughs> still with me. <laughs> Everybody's still awake out there. Are we good? Are we good? I know, I know, I know. This is this is long and drawn out, but it is extremely important, especially with the timing of our episode because of taxes and it's tax season, and you want to make sure that you do things correctly. And um, later on, we. I at least will be sharing a time when I did things wrong. So um, anyway. You and me both. Yeah. So you're an LLC and you want to pay yourself with an owner's draw. The rules are slightly different state by state. However, the IRS will see your LLC as a sole proprietorship. The rules explained earlier will apply to how you should pay yourself as an LLC if you're taxed as a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Now I'm heading back to paraphrasing. We're back to Patty. <laughs> if Patty's catering company were set up as an escort, then she would figure out a reasonable compensation for the type of work she does to pay herself a salary. You don't want to raise any red flags with the IRS. So her salary should be similar to what people in similar positions of, in her business, in her industry field would earn. She will also need to withhold taxes from her paychecks. However, to avoid withholding self-employment tax on the whole amount, Patty could also take a portion of her compensation as a distribution. Distributions are from earnings that were previously taxed at her personal rate. Keep in mind that Patty also needs to have enough equity to take distributions. For example, if Patty wants to uh, be paid $75,000 from her business, she might take $50,000 as a salary and distributions of $25,000. Okay, lastly, owners of a corporation are called shareholders, as Tiffany had mentioned. Let's say that Patty's catering company is a corporation, but she's the only shareholder. She has to pay herself a salary based on her reasonable compensation, just as she would if she were an escort. However, she can also receive a dividend, which is a distribution of her company's profits. That dividend would be taxed on her personal tax, re tax return. Keep in mind that her business doesn't have to pay her a dividend. Uh, she could choose to have the business retain some or all of the earnings and not pay a dividend at all. <sighs> now, you have to also keep in mind some key factors. Tax liabilities, 
funding your company, Social Security, Medicare, and the risks of drawing, taking draws that are too large. It's a lot of math. So make sure that you or the person in charge of your book of your books know what you're doing. I, I can't tell you what the best business structure is for your business. This is an opportunity for you to have a deep conversation with your CPA. Uh, but what I can tell you is that understanding the structure of your company will help you considerably in determining how you should get paid and, and how much you should be getting paid. So I said a lot about uh, owner's draw, and now we're going to talk a little about owner's equity. The owner's equity, uh, simply put, is an accumulation of money that has been spent on the business or withdrawn for personal use. Using the formula for this is assets minus liabilities or liabilities subtracted from assets, and this will equal your equity. It can be equipment, inventory, cash, anything your company uses to create tangible value. So then what are liabilities? Liabilities are a long-term debts that are owed by the business. So this could be a lease, a car note, uh, a loan. As QuickBooks says, if a company sells all of its assets for cash and then uses the cash to pay all the liabilities, any cash remaining is the firm's equity. Calculate your equity balance to help you better determine which is right for you. All right. So, <laughs> so now we're going to uh, now we're going to go a little into point counterpoint. Um, so, which do you prefer, salary draw or a little of both? So, I do prefer a little bit of both, but I am a strong advocate for salary, um, only because of this. Um, I think salary is just a little bit easier to get everybody's heads wrapped around. Um, mm -hmm. It does two things. One is, I mean, just on a day-to-day, -day, you know, living practicality, mm -hmm. you kind of want to, you kind of want to be able to take money home to be able to pay all your everyday bills, right? So, like right. you were saying, mortgage, your car, you know, mm -hmm. like you, you have the expenses you need to pay. So, I think salary is something that everybody's familiar with, and it's really easy to keep track of. Mm -hmm. The other reason why I like salary, just kind of in the greater scheme of setting up your business, is that salary shows up on your profit and loss, mm -hmm. right? So, salary is a deductible expense; it's an expense as your company. And it shows up there so that people don't forget to pay themselves or add the value of what their role is into the overall performance of the business. So simply put, for example, most business owners forget how much value they put into the business. So mm -hmm. as a business owner, as a startup, sometimes we forget we're the CEOs of the business. Or mm -hmm. if we're starting, uh, most likely we're also the uh, business development and the salesperson of the business. All of right? the things. All of the things above, right? These things mm -hmm. that... I find that when owners take a draw, because that ends up on a balance sheet, and we all know that most business owners don't quite look at the balance sheet because it's a little bit harder to understand. They feel like it's not as exciting as the profit and loss, which, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with you there, but as an accountant, I'm also geekily excited about the balance sheet because right. so much great info on it. But the problem is when it ends up there, business owners forget about that, right? And so- mm -hmm. When they look at the profit and loss as a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, and they don't see their own pay in there, that bottom line isn't really a true gauge of how well your business is doing, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> let's say that you do have a positive bottom line, but you're taking a draw. So it ends up on a balance, it ends up on a balance sheet and your profit and loss is a positive. Well, if you're not paying yourself anything, is it is that really true? Because if you were to replace yourself and hire another salesperson, mm -hmm. or hire a CEO to take over your company, are you really going to pay them nothing? Right. <laughs> so I just think it's so hard for like owners to get the heads wrapped around it. I think mm -hmm. that's why I'm like almost an advocate. Like, hey, when you can, when your business is stable, take a salary, right? Mm -hmm. It may be small because I like how the IRS is like, take a reasonable salary, right? And I'm like, well, great, <laughs> thanks for the word reasonable because who the heck knows what that means, right? Yeah. It's, you know, but I mean, basically they're saying like, somebody of your equal position, what would you pay yourself? Mm -hmm. And uh, sure, I mean, you can argue that all CEOs should be making six figures, but now if your company is only making five or four figures, that makes no right. sense. Whatsoever, right. Right. So, um, but the idea is that, you know, you, you want to take a salary when you're, when you're stable enough to do it. And if you can start small, start small, like you can kind of argue that because obviously like 
you're only going to take a few thousand if your company is only making tens of thousand mm -hmm. um, at the most. Um, and then build your way up there. Just obviously don't take too long doing it because mm -hmm. eventually as a CEO, I'm sure you want to make, you want to make your six figure salary as much as the next person, right? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So that's why I always advocate for the salary part, but I do like doing a combination of both, but that part gets yeah. a little trickier. I think you got to talk to your CPA about it to kind of mm -hmm. understand the tax implication of what's mm -hmm. advantageous to split up your pay as a whole between salary and distributions, because a lot of the, a lot of that flows into what your personal tax returns look like and where that puts you on the income bracket and everything like that. It's just, it's not very, it's not as easy as like, we can just throw out a number and just say, Hey, you know, take out 50,000. Like it's just, right. Right, so. right. <laughs> well, and I'm a, a huge fan of both a salary and a draw because um, I think that if you know, for sure, right? I, that's what I meant. Salary and a distribution. <laughs> sorry. Okay. A salary and a distribution, because you know, for sure that um, like, if you know for sure that your company can afford to give you X salary, then, but you, your expenses are an ebb and a flow. I think that if your CPA says it's okay, it's kind of like one of those things like first go to your doctor and make sure that it's okay. I kind of feel the same way about this. Like first go to your CPA and make sure that this is okay. Um, I think that if you're taking a, a salary, a set salary that doesn't break the bank of your business and then also take a distribution that will help you live to whatever your quality of life is and it doesn't um, negatively affect your company, your company's equity or, um, any of the liabilities. Yeah. That that's my personal opinion. And that's kind of what I do. So, but, yeah. that's what, yeah. but, but, you know, that's what my CPA suggested for me to do, but that wasn't always the case. So, um, you know, well, wherever no you're rails in place, right. Uh, what is like, that? There's some guardrails that are kind of built. Oh in yeah. Yeah. Sure that you don't and overdo it. Yeah. And my company, since um, starting my company, I went from being a sole proprietor to being uh, an LLC, a sole proprietor LLC to an S Corp. So every time that my company's structure changed, the way I got paid changed. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and this was always per the advice of my CPA. So it, I would say, OK, now now this is what I am. Now let's take a look at what my financials look like what is your suggestion on how I should get paid? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, and you were trying to break down what was that usually is a very complicated topic. I mean, mm -hmm. like I said, I wasn't kidding when I was saying that basis is always the number one thing I get asked. I'm not the tax accountant in, in, in the business. I mean, we're the business accountants, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm flattered that my clients want, thinks that I can like break down that whole thing really. And I can break it down simply, but I was like, it's a little more complicated than that. But I think usually that that's the guardrails I'm talking about, right? That basis right. is the guardrails where it's, it's like, you can't take out more of the business than what you one put in or two, the business is earning. Mm -hmm. And it gets a little complicated because then you have partners, right? So then it's not like you get a hundred percent of the profits. You only get like 50% of the profits right. added into your basis. And, mm -hmm. but that's the guardrail. And that's also the limitation. Because, mm -hmm. you know, people are like, well, I don't understand. Like, my bottom line is this. Why can't I just take that out? And it's like, well, no, that's like the math doesn't work out that way. Right. Not to mention, yeah, I mean, it's just, but that's also the restriction, which is mm -hmm. unfortunate. Especially mm -hmm. if you, you, if you are somebody who does need that flexibility of taking out the cash as you need it. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, so this is a lot to take in. <laughs> and so now we are going to dive into... The raw truth. Oh, the raw <laughs> truth. What business <laughs> behind small business is really like. <laughs> so welcome to a new segment hey. of our show called The Raw Truth. Mm. The Raw Truth is where we will each share our own gritty experience with today's topic. We want you, the listeners, to know that success isn't easy, it isn't pretty, and it's certainly not a straight line. We hope you will hear our cautionary tales and learn from them. You first. Oh, me first. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Um, okay, so my raw truth on this subject is uh, is this. Um, when I started, so yeah, here's the irony of it all, because I'm in accounting, and you would think in accounting, you know this stuff. But guess what? <laughs> Not all accountants are built the same, apparently. <laughs> so... Um, 
So when I first, so when it first started, so I think, I think what I realized is this, what nobody tells you about is, oh gosh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not getting so many people in trouble. Um, <laughs> my personal opinion, it's our podcast. We can say whatever we want. Um, my personal yeah. opinion is that 80 to 85% of tax CPAs or tax I say tax CPAs because most of the most of the CPAs I run into are, I mean, most of the tax preparers are CPAs, but I guess you could say tax preparers too because they're enrolled agents or whatever. Yeah, Anyways. but not all tax preparers are CPAs. Like a lot of them are, right. but not, not yeah, all of them are. yeah. But I think when I run into it, I think most clients I know and um, even myself, like our, our, our tax professionals happen to be CPA. So that's why I'm kind of using that as like a general mm-hmm. term. But I would say that 85 to 90% of tax CPAs or tax preparers that work with small business owners mm-hmm. are reactive. Uh, meaning that, and it makes sense, right? Because when you think about it, you know, they're working with hundreds of clients. Like you are not their sole client. They do not sit there in the middle of the night thinking about what's the best way for you to lower your particular tax liability. They do not take out your tax return and look at it and actually spend minutes staring at it, thinking of new strategies for you without you asking, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think what happens is I think you realize as a small business owner, you got to know enough and be smart enough to be dangerous and at least ask the right questions to kind of prompt them to help you look at things a certain way. So for example, prompting them to say, Hey, can you run me a calculation? So I understand what my position is if I was to take a salary plus a distribution versus just taking draws for the next two years. So if you're in the middle of being an LLC and you're not sure if you're going to elect as an S corp yet, where you want to change it to an S corp or a C corp, like, those are conversations I feel like most of the time you have to prompt. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, your account, like your tax account is more than like capable of doing it, but mm-hmm. they're not going to sit there and think that, that they're not going to anticipate that's what you want, right? Mm-hmm. So you just have to ask for that. So anyway, so my, my truth is that even for myself as an accountant, I'm not a tax accountant, just so that everybody knows, um, as an accountant, what I did, because I'm a geek, uh, was I took out my Excel and uh, naturally on my Excel, this was, I did the same thing as you. I went from like a sole proprietor to a single member LLC, and then I elected as an S corp. And the reason why I ended up electing as an S corp was, you know, one day I'm sitting there looking at my tax return, and the one thing that really sucks as a business owner is writing that that, that tax check. Oh right? my gosh! Because it doesn't come out of your paycheck anymore, right? So yes. you know, I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a young I'm a young gal. I I had a salary for a while working for somebody else. You know, the taxes came. I just never really thought about it, right? And then all of a sudden, you're writing this check, and you're like, whoa, like this is how much I make. Like, this is how much I'm giving over. Like, what is going on? So that got me to sit down and I took out my Excel and I took out like the tax stuff. And I basically, you know, recalculated everything to come to realize this little thing called self-employment tax that is freaking so high. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait, I don't understand. Why am I being penalized for being a single member LLC? Like, I, why am I paying more taxes? Like, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. And so... That's what really drove me to start looking into, oh, wait, there's S corps and, oh, you need to take salary. And this is what it means. But like, I mean, I did the calculation myself, but that's also because I was doing my own taxes then, mm-hmm. which I do not recommend to other people unless you're an actual tax accountant. And, um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, I find out even with clients, like you, you kind of like your tax, your tax account can help you with this stuff and you should be asking these questions and mm-hmm. figure out what the best scenario is for you because otherwise you're just giving away money. Yep. <laughs> and I felt like I gave away money for my first couple of years as a single member LLC, not even mm-hmm. realizing the fact that I'm paying more in taxes as a business owner than I was as an employee. Yeah. Like what the heck? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I also, I highly recommend you after tax season, give your, give your CPA a month. Um, <clears throat> That's true. They're all on vacation. The week yeah. They're right all on vacation season. anyway. So just, yeah. So just wait until May. <laughs> uh, but I highly suggest that once a year you get together with him or her and have a conversation about the status of your company, uh, where your company's been, where you think it may be headed, and what their suggestions are for you to prepare for the following tax season. Um, yeah. That, that is how I went from being one structure to the next to the next because my because I uh, consulted with my CPA and he said, you know, it looks like you probably should be moving up in, in the type of structure or the way that you pay yourself uh, and what have you. So, yeah, and I think it's it is I, I personally do feel like it is unfair 
to just expect your task count to kind of come out of nowhere and figure all this out for you without you prompting because they're not going to be aware of what's on your mind. But yeah. doing what you do, you did, Savannah, and the same thing I did was just, you know, you 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 prompt the conversation, right? And then you right. know just enough to ask the conversation so that they ask the question so that they understand what your goals are and then mm -hmm. they can help look at your tax returns and your numbers from a way to reach whatever your goals are, which, I mean, let's just submit it for all of us. 99% of it is to lower our tax liability as much as possible. Absolutely. <laughs> Everybody knows that it's not illegal. Just do it right. Don't, yeah. don't do it illegally. <laughs> uh, of course. And I myself have had a love hate relationship with paying myself since the beginning of my business. I started off paying myself very little thinking, um, I really don't want to pay a ton in taxes. Uh, but then I realized the less, um, the less I look like I make, the less I could get credit for like a car or house, et cetera. So I started paying myself more. And then, you know, then I was paying like a, a ton in taxes, mm. uh, just like you. I was like, what the, what the heck? Like, why am I paying so much? Yeah. I then realized that what I was doing um, was not in how I was getting paid. It was in how it looked in my P&L uh, profit and loss report. So this is kind of embarrassing to admit, <laughs> But I was showing my net profit at the bottom of my PL as what I was make I was making each year. Me, the person, not the company. Um, so I paid so much in taxes. <laughs> it wasn't even correct. <laughs> um, how could I have made such a mistake? I had to restructure my my PL and my balance sheet because that was a mess too. I don't know how I got there or how I did it. Um, because the picture of my company was skewed. Uh, so then I had to fix it all. And once it was fixed, the, the picture of my company, the taxes that I owed were now finally correct and clear. And thankfully it happened earlier on in my business. Um, but I could see how anybody could make a, a simple mistake like that. At least I hope that I can see anyone making a simple mistake like that. So um, anyway, so I hope that uh, our listeners like this new segment where we show you the you know the ugly truth of what some business owners uh experience while they're they're climbing it's it's like i said not a straight it's line a mess in the background that's what it means i mean yeah so it is. it is and you know sometimes who is it i think it's um Robin Roberts that says, make your mess your message. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where I feel like we are. We, we have to share. I think that it's important for us to share the part of us that isn't uh, successful, isn't uh, perfect so that you know that you're not alone when you make a mistake and you're like, oh my gosh, how could I have done such a thing? Well, it's definitely so, not glamorous. I'll tell you that. Right? No, not glamorous. Yeah. Well, and although sometimes they are glamorously horrible. <laughs> so but I guess you know if as accountants ourselves you know people in the accounting field ourselves can make mistakes like oh that. yeah absolutely um, I'm not perfect although I may look it I am not the, the thing is well I mean it's kind of like anything else right it's like the last thing we want to do is our own accounting I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah. Like I, exactly. So, I mean, who knows what was happening in my head? I, I, who knows, who knows? I also at the time had a very little, little one and I had two older ones and like all these things were happening on in my life. So I forgave myself for that mistake, but I'm also glad that I, I, I fixed it. I found it and I fixed it, but sheesh. Anyway, I mean, you would never allow that. Like, you would never have allowed that on your clients' books. Oh, absolutely not. Like, like you totally like let yourself off the hook and, you know, like yeah. did that on your own books. So, and that's, I think that is so common because I think mm -hmm. as business owners, you know, we, we do place our client stuff first. Right? Oh, absolutely. Foremost. And ours is like whatever leftover energy we have, maybe we'll go <laughs> get around to doing it at some point. Right. But that's absolutely. Truth. It's doing us, ourselves a disservice. Like it's normal. But in the long run, what happens is you end up picking up the slack because you were like, mm -hmm. oh, no, 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 no. Like, you know, I, I work too hard to get here to do this, mm -hmm. to pay this much in taxes. Like, I owe myself the time to stop and figure this out so that, you know, I stand up my own back office right. <laughs> well right. enough to continue servicing our clients. Right. So, yep. <laughs> well, anyway. Waiting for everything. Um, <laughs> in each of 
<laughs> in each episode, we like to connect a famous example to our discussion to help you relate our talking points on a more global or well-recognized scale. Sometimes we use exact examples of either famous persons or successful businesses, business owners of today or in history. And sometimes we use examples of people who inspire us and have inspired today's discussion. So I didn't, I, I'm going to, I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> That's fine. I think my uh, example is probably good enough for the both of us. Um, well, so, but I couldn't really choose someone famous or historical for this particular subject. It's kind of a um, uh, highly specific subject. Uh, so I chose someone. Um, I will say that the person I chose found clever ways to fund his company, and he's a true inspiration to me. He's an example I've used various times with my own kids that one failure or setback doesn't define you, it's what you do with that failure that does. Kevin Plank was one of five siblings living in Kensington, Maryland. He was an athletic kid playing football uh, for the local rec league. He wasn't the best student and didn't exactly showcase model behavior, which led to his departure from Georgetown Prep, a local prestigious Catholic school. He did go on to graduate from St. John's College High School in 1990 with aspirations. He played football at Fork Union Military Academy for a year with the hopes of moving on to an NCAA Division I university, but alas, he was not recruited by any of the top-tier college uh, collegiate football programs. He transferred to the University of Maryland College Park and walked onto the team there. While at the University of Maryland, Plank launched Cupid's Valentine, a seasonal business selling roses on Valentine's Day. Cupid's Valentine, or uh, Cupid's Valentine earned $3,000, which Plank used as seed money for his now famous business. While playing for the Maryland Terrapins, Plank said he was the sweatiest guy on the football field. Mm. He was frustrated by his cotton t-shirts and ability to keep him dry and comfortable. And so he searched for a material that would wick the sweat off his body. After graduating from Maryland in 1996 with a bachelor's degree in business administration, he searched for synthetic materials that would keep athlete, athletes dry. Using a mix of his own cash, credit cards, and a small business administration loan, he launched his business. Plank tried several prototypes before deciding on the one he wanted to use. Plank originally planned to call his new sportswear company Heart, but he could not trademark it. He then attempted to name his company Body Armor, but those efforts were also unsuccessful as well. One day, his brother asked him, how's that company you're working on, Under Armour? The name stuck. Plank chose the British spelling Armour because he thought the phone number 888 armor with a U was much more compelling than 888 armor without the U. Plank initially ran the... Yeah, I mean, hey, why not? Plank initially ran the business from his grandmother's townhouse in Georgetown and sold his first successful prototype shirt from his car. Using his connections, he asked former teammates to try on the shirts, claiming that his alternative to a cotton t-shirt would enhance their performance on the field. As his friends moved on to play professionally, he would send them t-shirts, requesting that they pass them out to the other players in the locker rooms. His first big team sale was to Georgia Tech. In 1996, Plank finished his first year selling shirts with 17,000 in sales. A turning point for him came late in 1999 when Plank used nearly all of Under Armour's money and employees agreed to go without pay for a few weeks so the company could take out a $25,000 advertisement in ESPN, the magazine. The ad resulted in a million dollars in direct sales for the following year, and athletes and teams began buying the product. Plank's company reached a billion dollars in annual revenue for the first time in 2010, and Plank became a billionaire in 2011 when his net worth was estimated at $1.505 billion. Wow, is that it? Is that all? A billion? Yeah, right? I mean, in all honesty, he, I guess it does kind of connect to A because he had to be creative in the way that he paid himself and had to be careful because he did have a lot of overhead. He had a lot of 
fabric and the and the sewing machines and like all of that stuff as inventory. So he really couldn't pay himself much of anything at all. Uh, and then he also had to request his employees when he could finally afford employees to withhold payroll from them for a few weeks so that the company could afford to take a chance on itself. And obviously his employees believed in him enough to be okay with that. That's incredible to me. I mean, so, there's a reason why they are still around doing that really, is true. really well. Yeah. With each episode, we like to share either books, tools, apps, or platforms, or anything we think is a great next step and connector to our discussion. If so, if you like our subject matter and want to learn more, you'll have a great place to start. So believe it or not, they didn't really have any books that talks about True. equity and pay. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing that I would recommend probably because who would want to read that? Like, right. um, honestly, like my advice is pretty, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty like back of the napkin trick, right? Like if you, if you don't know how much to pay yourself, take out your P&L, mm -hmm. run it for like month to month for the last 12 months or something like that. Stick mm -hmm. a number in there and play around with it and see how much you can afford to pay yourself. Right. right? Like that's, that's the best you can do. And you can also, you know, also just estimate for the next 12 months how much do you think you're going to make mm -hmm. and how much you can afford to pay yourself and how realistic is that kind of forecast you're doing right like it doesn't right. have to be complicated it doesn't have to be more than just additions and subtractions there's no fancy formula to this at all right, right? you just decide whether or not you can the company can afford to pay you and if that number is too low then you have other questions to ask yourself you know what can i do like uh, i mean there's really only Two, two parts to the business. It's either you increase your revenue or lower your expenses, like right. one or the other, right? But it's like, you know, what can you do and start asking those kind of questions? If you're not paying yourself anything today at all and you've been in business for more than, a, let's say two years, okay? Mm -hmm. I get it, the first year, year and a half, it's a little bit of a, you know, tricky situation timing. But in two years time, if you're not paying yourself anything, then you really need to take a look at your business and kind of figure out your strategy. Right. Yeah, like it's just it's it's more of an honest conversation with yourself. But yeah, the best way to figure it out is do it in do it in Excel. Do it. Well, I would say do it in Excel, but I'm a geek, right? So uh, <laughs> I do everything in Excel. I'd probably write stuff in Excel if I could. It's like doing <laughs> Excel whenever I can uh, for anything. Um, and um, yeah, and kind of calculate it out for yourself to see what works, and then take it to a tax professional, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Take it to somebody else that can kind of help you look at it from a greater perspective of, mm -hmm. you know, your taxes in general, because you're not just your business. You know, you have a personal life, too, and your personal life probably has tax implications that right. kind of roll, roll up into that. Right. And mm -hmm. that's what they're there for. They'll help you. And like I said, they may not be proactive, but they're there and capable as long as you're prompting the right question. So I think mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, you may... People don't quite utilize their tax CPAs as much as they could because they just don't ask the questions. And I would say, yeah, have that conversation. Yep, definitely. Um, I can't say I have a book or anything to recommend. That is <laughs> but as far as platforms go, I suggest starting off with QuickBooks. And if you're going to pay via payroll uh, to use ADP. I really like how user-friendly both platforms are. And although I don't recommend you go it alone, meaning I suggest you have a professional use these platforms on behalf of your company, they yeah. are really good at being understandable to laymen. I also recommend if you like YouTube to uh, subscribe to the QuickBooks channel and to Hector Garcia. I really like how he teaches and how he explains payroll, owner's draws, etc. He's an instructor for QuickBooks. So you kind of get two for one there. And we're going to be linking um, both of those uh, channels on, in our show notes. And uh, another thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that we are now going to be posting our podcasts on YouTube moving forward for season three. So you will have an opportunity to either watch us. Oh, um, literally watch us. Literally oh my God. watch us. Yes, literally watch us on YouTube. Uh, or you can listen to us um, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, so please join us for our next episode. We will, um, our next episode is going to be discussing employee manuals and SOPs, which are standards of procedures, and where to start. 
where to start? Ah, oh, riveting, riveting information. Um, <laughs> riveting and necessary. Yes, and it's absolutely. What we want to talk about, so we'll see if we can actually make it entertaining because. Gonna, gonna do my best. Um, <laughs> please, show, please, show, <clears throat> please show us your support by following us on your preferred podcast platform, social media, and YouTube. And we are also going to, we have some other new stuff that we're going to be introducing as the shows go along, which are going to be our social media platforms and where we will be able to continue discussions after our shows. So, um, please share our episodes, like us, um, share us, keep us, keep us close. And um, <laughs> all of the links will be posted uh, below. Until next time, mind the business behind your business because all great successes start small. Thank you.